This video is going to be a mock draft preview, something that's that's way overdue. And, and I want to do more often as the draft gets closer. If you're new to my channel or new to my content, I try to initiate discussion and get suggestions from viewers on what, what players they'd like to see their team select with my pre-draft videos. I'm going to show you a mock draft that we did and focus on the Ravens and Lions first round options and how the players available at 29 and 30 will impact each team's approach for the rest of the draft. Now, the Ravens have not had much salary cap space at all uh, to make free agent signings or trades from, from a numerical standpoint. What, far more players going out than, than coming back in. Uh, the restructure of Ronnie Stanley obviously is going to help. They did get the big one, if you ask me, the two-year deal with Derrick Henry. I did a film study on Henry that you're welcome to check out if you want. I'll, I'll link it up here and put it in the description. He's their only free agent signing, but I think he's one of the biggest ones across the league so far. He might be 30 years old, just turned 30 in January, uh, by the way, but I think he's got a lot left in the tank. And you can look at the film from 2023 in the film study video I did to try to um, reveal that to you. The Lions, on the other hand, have been extremely active, trading for Carlton Davis III and then signing defensive pieces, Amik Robertson, Marcus Davenport and the defensive tackle DJ Reader from the Bengals, who is a dominant force against the run. He's a guy who us Ravens fans have a lot of familiarity with. and We know how well he can impact the game. I did this mock draft in a, in a little bit different fashion. I'll briefly go through some of the selections from early in the first round. Certainly there'll be some disagreement on who a team would or would not select. I'll try to break down for a moment each of the AFC North and NFC North teams, the ones that Ravens and Lions fan would, fans would have some knowledge or familiarity with themselves from a games played standpoint. I actually really enjoy the pre-draft videos, the mock draft stuff. It allows me to try to be a little creative with the projections and the style of video that I put out there, certainly different than a film study video, even though at times it can be wildly off base. I admit that up front. In terms of what certain teams will actually do, my projections could be uh, far out from left field. Now, not for Baltimore or the, or the Lions, if you ask me, because I think their needs are pretty well known, certainly by Ravens fans. We know we need an upgrade at tackle at some point. It might be 2024 might be 2025 therefore we should probably draft one now in preparation for next year definitely an option at pick 30 um, as you can see i have them taking guyton there in the first scenario here there's some questions still at outside linebacker d end as i record this on sunday the probable departures of jadavion Clowney and, and kyle van noy those two combined for almost 20 sacks in 2023 in the regular season that is and then the health of david ojabo and the progress of Odafe Owe, or lack thereof at times, means that a talented outside linebacker there at 30, when the Ravens pick first, is definitely a possibility. That's a position of need for Detroit also. So if a guy like Darius Robinson was available at 29, he may not be available to the Ravens at 30 because the Lions could pick him one spot ahead. The Lions just signed or traded for Robertson, a young, talented, and versatile corner who played with the Raiders. And then Carlton Davis III, obviously extremely well-known from his time spent in Tampa Bay, improves their secondary drastically. But could they take a corner if someone talented enough is there late in the first round? Absolutely is, is within the realm of possibility as well. So with questions like those in mind, I briefly pose them to prepare you that my mock drafts that I'll do are, are going to have some variability. Uh, they're going to be malleable, and I'll present different scenarios. I'm not going to say this is who I would pick because the, it depends on how the board falls, number one. Number two, it depends on what happens between now and then, the round, round one of the draft, a little over a month from now in terms of free agent acquisitions. Those questions are why I like to do the mock draft videos because I think it initiates discussion, and also people suggest players to me that I can then go watch film of and adjust what I think. Because to be honest with you, I've spent most of my time focusing on corner, wide receiver, uh, with some quarterback play. Haven't been able to get to the offensive line nearly as much as I've wanted to. Number one and number two, the two of the mock drafts I did, where I was preparing to complete a video, uh, got destroyed by the constant stream of trades that have happened over the last week. Basically, I would complete a mock draft, and then it was rendered pointless less than 10 or 12 hours later by a trade that happened with Kenny Pickett, 
uh, Keenan Allen. Not really the Justin Fields trade, but it kind of reset what would have been realistic in the opening 18 or 20 picks, and that's related to what would be available for a first the Lions and then the Ravens when they finally do select. So with that being said, picks 1 through 11. I have the Patriots passing up on Jaden Daniels at 3. Not that I don't think he's a talented player because I really like him a lot. But Marvin Harrison Jr., a wide receiver, I think I think he's a player that's going to be really difficult to pass on. Uh, perhaps unrealistic because you would say the same thing about Daniels. Why would you pass on him if you need a quarterback? I had the Vikings trading up with the Cardinals to take uh, Daniels at 4. And, and keep Justin Jefferson engaged. Chargers not in the market for a quarterback, so they're a, definitely a possible trade-back team in the event that someone like the Giants, maybe a, a team like the Vikings, thinks that after after the Patriots do not select a quarterback at three, making Jaden Daniels available at four, in my opinion, that would mean the Cardinals become an extreme opportunist there with multiple offers coming in for them to trade back. And in this scenario, I have them trading with the Vikings, who take Jaden Daniels. Uh, Bears, eventually at pick nine, and look, this, this selection of Jackson Powers Johnson is probably too soon for most people. I had a lot of difficulty with this this selection at pick nine, this decision. Outside linebacker DN felt like too soon, unless it was Verse or Latu. Uh, some seemed like to me the interior offensive line was a position that they could bolster to a roster that's just improved dramatically in the last two weeks. I'm not sure that's the decision. That's the direction that the Bears will actually go, but JPJ looks like an instant starter, whereas a couple of the other guards or centers, center slash guards, I'm not so sure that they walk in and start on day one. The Jets and Cardinals uh, both going wide receiver to finish the opening third of the first round. Neighbors pairing up with Garrett Wilson and Aaron Rodgers. Sounds like a dangerous offense, especially now that they've traded for Morgan Moses and they signed a longtime Cowboys left tackle, uh, Tyron Smith. Cardinals having trade back, comfortable taking either Neighbors or Thomas, whoever was there, and they gain an additional second rounder in that in that trade. Even though they already have a ton of picks, I think it's eleven at this point. Maybe the maybe the ending of the first uh, eleven picks is unrealistic. There, maybe the whole thing is. Picks twelve through twenty two start with the Broncos taking JJ McCarthy at twelve. Personally, I think that's a little high. Uh, I, I value a couple of other guys. Penix being the main one a little bit more than McCarthy, but I understand Pe Penix has the health concerns and his age is an issue as well. Patriots trading back in the first round later on to take Bo Nix, again, ahead of Penix. From a personal opinion standpoint, I like Michael Penix better than both of those guys. In this scenario that I'm presenting here, I kind of was swayed or influenced by what most other people are indicating is going to happen. Obviously, Bowers falling to the Bengals and Leitu falling to 19 with the Rams is not going to happen, or at least I don't think in the case of both of them. I would hope it doesn't from a Ravens standpoint because that's a nightmare offense to deal with in Cincinnati. If they end up with Burrow, Chase, Higgins, and a talented tight end like Bowers, all healthy and on the field at the same time. I think the Cincinnati is going tackle in the first round, but you couldn't blame them for taking someone like Bowers if he's available when they pick at 18. The Dolphins may not take a D tackle at 21 with Newton off the board already to the Seahawks at 16. Nonetheless, I had them taking Taylor to keep him home and replace Christian Wilkins at 21. Almost every mock draft that I do, I have the Bucks taking Jared Verst in the first round. I'm not sure why, but it's like no matter what I do, no matter what my perspective is or my focus, that's where he ends up going. Cooper DeJean is listed as a safety on the website that I used which I really don't see happening until maybe later on in his career. I think he's a super talented player. The film of him at Iowa is fantastic. So let's get to the Lions and the Ravens scenario first here at the end of the first round. This is the, both teams trying to focus on and improve their offensive lines. So in terms of Detroit, BB is there, and there's certainly other guys who are ranked a little bit higher than him, but as a really excellent run blocker, particularly good on zone schemes, thought it'd be a great selection uh, for, De for Detroit. If JPJ was to fall to the the what is customary position in most of the mock drafts you see. Certainly, he's a guy that could be selected there at 29. I don't really have a favorite tackle for the Ravens in this range, to be honest with you. I feel like there's three or four guys that are probably going to be available in this range. And the guy from Washington, I don't expect to be here at 30 and 31. 
But in this version, I have the Ravens, both teams, trying to improve their offensive line, and the Ravens, in this case, going with Guyton from Oklahoma. With the trade of Morgan Moses and the uncertain health of Ronnie Stanley, it makes sense that the Ravens go tackle here. It would not surprise me, however, if both teams went in a different direction. And so we'll let these rotate here in a moment. I could absolutely see the Lions taking an edge rusher, outside linebacker, whatever you want to refer to the position as. Darius Robinson from Missouri certainly has all the physical characteristics. And then the Ravens choosing to address a wide receiver arch type that they do not currently have. I, re I really like Keon Coleman. I think he plays much faster than the 40 time at the Combine. I could see him going anywhere from the 23 to 32 range all, all the way up to pick 40, depending on a team's need and how, how they evaluate his film versus uh, the 40 time at the Combine. In this scenario, I guess we'll call this version 1-2, the Ra Ravens and Lions both eschew improving their offensive lines, and they leave guys like Guyton and a Washington tackle alone, for, in the case of the Ravens, to grab a 6'3 or 6'4 wide receiver who can make contested catches, and Detroit tries to address their edge rusher position along with the free agent signing to Marcus Tavenport by taking Darius Robinson. third possibility, which will let flow all three of those here. You may prefer pick, uh, opportunity one or scenario one or scenario two in terms of the offensive line versus position players. I do think it'll be a very interesting moment or situation for me once we get to the Bills pick at 28. If Mitchell, Worthy, uh, Coleman are still on the board, which I expect Coleman to be, when the Bills draft at 28, their pick and the Lions ensuing pick at 29 influences directly, I think, what's available for the Ravens. And what I mean specifically is Darius Robinson. If Darius Robinson is taken by the Lions, then he's not available for the Ravens. I do not anticipate, and no one does, Detroit taking a tackle. So whatever tackle exists after Arizona drafts, it'll be up to the Bills and then the Ravens to kind of grab before San Francisco or the Chiefs can get a hold of him. I like to let multiple outcomes flow here over the top of what I'm talking about, I do think there's something to be said for drafting Keon Coleman in the first round because of his age. I think he's still only 21 years old. A playmaker, um, he, he never redshirted at Michigan State or Florida State, so that's why he's so young. And in fact, he was athletic enough to play for Michigan State's basketball team briefly before transferring or going in the portal to go to Florida State. To me, getting that extra year available might be tempting for a team like the Ravens, who still haven't decided uh, whether to extend Rashad Bateman or not prior to the 2024 season. Ravens are certainly going wide receiver at some point in this draft, maybe twice. I do not think it's round one, but I'm open to the possibility that I could be wrong, and the Ravens grab Keon Coleman at 30. The third possibility that flows through here for you is the Lions taking a corner. Even with the signing of Robertson and the trade for Davis, they do have little cornerback depth that's signed long-term, I should say. In terms of Robertson, he's 25 years old, has fantastic film, really a great signing. I think he can play anywhere, but the Lions still need to draft an outside corner somewhere along the line in this draft. I think they go 29, 61, and then 73. It could be Rakestraw here or Lassiter from Georgia. I'm not really sure that Lassiter's um, RAS score is in the range that Brad Holmes uh, apparently looks for. The guys who would be, TJ Tampa, Max Melton, are in that range in terms of speed and athleticism, but they, but they don't have as big a name to some. Mike St. Restol would be the hometown pick for the Lions since he played at the University of Michigan. But he's not really a Michigan guy. He was born in Haiti and then played high school I think in Massachusetts, and really I don't think he's the pick at, at 29 for Detroit, even though I really like his film and versatility. He's a guy who illustrates the point for me, regardless of team, someone who will be there at 29 for the Lions or 30 for the Ravens, but will not be there with their second round pick. And that's where you get teams, quote, reaching for a player because they understand they don't want to trade, they want to, don't want to trade back up earlier into the second round and give up future draft capital. Uh, one thing to mention, with the Lions pick at 29, supposedly Chris Spielman, who is an amazing player in Detroit, if you don't know, supposedly he's visited Western Michigan and Illinois this year. And by the way, shout out to Josh 
in our Lions Discord for that information. Previously, last year, he attended Iowa and Alabama's Pro Days. And, of course, the Lions ended up taking Brian Branch from Alabama and then Jack Campbell and Sam Laporta, both from Iowa. Sets them up, obviously, to look at Marshall Nealon from Western Michigan. In my opinion, I don't see them taking the D tackle from Illinois um, in round one or round two, so I'm not sure who else he could be looking at. The Ravens going after an outside linebacker or D end in round one, I think is the lowest percentage play here. I think they're going tackle, maybe wide receiver in round one, depending on who's there. Here's here's as so we have to assume that Rashad Bateman stays healthy for the following statements to to make any sense. In 2023, the Ravens did something really smart. I think they comboed Bateman and OBJ, basically split their reps in a lot of ways. They spent, I think, only like 230 plays on the field together all throughout 2023. I got that info, and that, and that might number 230 might be wrong, but it's not off by much. It might have been 250. I got that info on Twitter from uh, Jonah Schaefer, Schaefer. Hopefully I said that name right. If not, my apologies. He had responded to a post that uh, some, someone had made and gave those stats away. So that was really cool. I'm paraphrasing his data that OBJ and OBJ, OBJ and Bateman was only on the field for like 230 plays, if I recall. More often than not, one of them was on the field and the other one was on the sideline. Essentially, they were rotated. Injuries did play a role in that. OBJ missed two games, week three and four. And then Rashad Bateman missed week four as well at at Cleveland, and did not. And even though he did play in Week 18, he didn't receive a target. So that's an issue for me in terms of someone take, saying take wide receiver in round one. We can't even get Bateman enough. the The offense right now can't accommodate so many guys who need and maybe deserve the ball. Is it a lack of chemistry with Bateman and Lamar? Maybe. If so, what sense does it make to draft a wide receiver in round one? Perhaps it makes more sense to you than it does to me. I would be okay if a great player was there for us. There will be other guys available later in round two. Worthy, who the Chiefs scoop up uh, two picks later in every single mock that I do. Uh, the Bills have already taken Mitchell. and They're still talented and, and mostly proven wide receivers available at 30 for the Ravens. McConkie, Troy Franklin from Oregon, Ricky Pearsall, who I really have not watched much film of, to be honest with you. I think the Ravens go wide receiver in round two or perhaps trade up if there's a run on wide receivers or multiple runs on wide receivers and, and tackles already been addressed. It would be a whole lot easier for me to accept that course of action for the Ravens tackle in round one, wide receiver in round two, if the Ravens front office thinks both of those guys are ready to contribute immediately. Whatever tackle they take in round one, whatever receiver they take in round two. I don't know who that is. I do know that at receiver right now, Baltimore has Zay Flowers, Bateman, and Aguilar, and that's it. So clearly there's got to be one or maybe even two guys drafted to build depth for this season, not roll into 2024 with a lack of depth and no big X archetype. <clears throat> and since they have four of the top 113 picks now, after switching spots with the Jets, I think the Ravens have an excellent opportunity to uh, address tackle, someone who can compete or be better than Makari and Falele immediately, a wide receiver who can contribute early, maybe not start, but contribute, and then hopefully a, an outside linebacker DN that doesn't need two or three years to refine his moves and skill set in order to get pressure on the quarterback. That's all assuming that neither Clowney nor Van Noy comes back because there's a lot of snaps missing if both those guys are gone. There's a lot of productivity gone as well, pressures and uh, variability plays, meaning Van Noy was great at dropping into coverage, and Clowney was underrated in that role as well. By pick 130, the Ravens, in my opinion, have to have accomplished the task of doubling up somewhere, meaning either one free agent signing, re-signing at outside linebacker, and one draft pick, or another running back since Keaton Mitchell is going to be out late in the season. I don't mean they're one of their first three picks. I mean somewhere in round four, a possible running back pick because Keaton Mitchell, look, he may not return at all. It's going to be very late in the season. And then you also have the issue of corner. There's a lot of money tied up in Marlon Humphrey who missed a lot of time in 2023, missed time in 2022. Now, when he did play, generally played very well in both of those seasons. I think he was a much better player in 2022 
from a consistency standpoint than he was in 2023. Nonetheless, there's a lot of money tied up in him. And at some point, the Ravens got to address Brandon Stevens' contract. When we lost Ronald Darby, that was a huge deal. There's multiple positions to address here in this draft. I just described some of them. Tackle, outside linebacker, edge, running back, corner, wide receiver. It's a tall task for the Ravens who have been helped by the restructuring of Ronnie Stanley's contract. That opened up way more options in terms of free agency or re-signing a guy like Clowney. It does look like to me like Van Noy is content to just sit and wait until late in the process. Can't blame him. From a Ravens perspective, we would like that spot, outside linebacker, to be solidified before the draft so that there wasn't so much pressure on looking at a talented guy in those first two picks, 30 and 62 could be used to find either instant starters at tackle and wide receiver, or in the case of wide receiver, someone who can contribute but doesn't have to take too many snaps away from Bateman, Flowers, and Aguilar. I do recognize that this um, this mock draft is quite different from probably most of the other ones that you guys have paid attention to or maybe listened to videos on. So if you listen this long, first of all, thank you. I am open about the the uncertainty at 29 for the Lions and 30 for the Ravens. I don't mean it to be a cop-out when I present different options there for both teams. In my opinion, the talented offensive line might be too good to pass up for both. Particularly the Ravens, who in 2023, from an offensive line standpoint, they were less stable when everyone was healthy. And that was very rare. But with now Morgan Moses traded, Simpson signed with the Jets, and then Zeitler's uh, instability or the unknown uh, nature of it. I mean, I mean, wow, you got two-fifths of the starters returning. That's it right now for the Ravens in Linderbaum and Ronnie Stanley. And Ronnie Stanley had a stretch in 2023 where probably because of injury, maybe because, maybe he came back too soon, he was incapable of anchoring such that outside rushers couldn't just bull rush him at times and push him right into Lamar Jackson's lap. We have a reigning MVP at quarterback and an offensive line that right now is only returning 40% of its starters. That has to be addressed first, in my opinion. With the talent that's available at offensive line, it has to be addressed and probably addressed twice in the first five picks. It's a tough ask of the Ravens' front office to address so many positions with Picks 30, 62, 93, 113, and then 130. That's their first five selections. The Ravens are built for it. They've done it before. But the added difficulty factor in that so many teams will be vying for talent at wide receiver, tackle, and edge rusher, in my opinion, means something else has got to be addressed in free agency before the draft to make it actually feasible to just reload the roster like they did in 2023. I hope you enjoyed the style of the video. I will change it up for my mock draft videos later on this week, meaning I'll focus on one team for each video. <clears throat> Ravens fans who pay attention to my content and check it out for the last couple of years know what I'll do is offer it like this. What would you think if the Ravens' first three selections are these three players? Or how would you feel as a Lions fan if your team walked away with these three players at 29, 61, and 73? Really blessed position that Detroit is in, if you ask me, to have those three selections, 29, 61, and 73. When you talk about trying to improve the offensive line and outside corner position, the Lions can do that in those first three picks. The added element of defensive end outside linebacker, to me, makes Brad Holmes, put Brad Holmes in a slightly different position than the 2023 draft. I don't mean to say he was playing with house money in 2023 because they hit on every single pick. Hendon Hooker didn't get a chance to play and will not for the foreseeable future. It's unfair to me to say that that pick was wasted uh, because you you obviously need a backup quarterback, number one. Number two, to be able to grab a talented guy like him to have as a security blanket in case Jared Goff went down, I think was ultimately very smart. 29, 61, and 73 is far different than two of the top 18 picks. Six and 18, which ended up being, I think, 12 and 18 last year and then parlayed that into three second-round picks, two beautiful selections, Brian Branch and Sam Laporta. 
when I do these videos, I try to pose the questions or situations in a realistic way. Impossible to project the entire first round, which I have shown to you there. So I'm quite sure if you want to screenshot it and in a couple of, in a couple of weeks after the draft gets done, let me know how far off base I was. Feel free. This one's actually going to be really fun if you ask me. Want this draft, once we get the fat past the first pick, because the Bears have gone all in on winning in 2024 and have cleared the way for um, a somewhat local kid to the area that you know Baltimore fans are from. Caleb Williams is a D.C. kid, went to Gonzaga, a lot of success there, unable to play his senior year because of, of the pandemic. Uh, they've built a great supporting cast already, and their pick at pick nine I think is going to have a ripple effect thereafter in round one. Do they go interior offensive line? I haven't pick, taken Jackson Powers Johnson. Or do they go with another wide receiver to pair with Keenan Allen and DJ Moore? Just give Caleb Williams another weapon. It's my opinion that the Bears pick at nine, number one. And number two, who trades up in front of the Giants to possibly select a quarterback if the Patriots don't? That's going to have a ripple effect on how far down some of these talented players like Brock Bowers, Latou, and Terrion Arnold as well, who I think is an extremely high-level corner, how far down they get pushed into the teens because so many quarterbacks and tackles and receivers are taken in the top 10. I appreciate you guys' time. Whether you're a Ravens or a Lions fan, please consider let me know what you think of the video in the comment section. And if you think other football fans in general would enjoy this somewhat unusual mock draft that I completed here, then please consider grabbing a link to this video, sharing it out on social media to help this content get more reach.